we were saying, talking earlier on, you know, about not having a conventional early life, as the same with John, of course. Um, you had a, the both of you had a huge uh, appreciation of Chuck Berry. Absolutely. I mean, he loved Little Richard, Chuck Berry, all those old, you know, great rockers, because they really did um, change his life as well, you know, and met, met Chuck a few times. Mm. And probably the most trivial thing I'm going to ask you today, chocolate. What uh, were your and John's favorite chocolates? Well, John was a chocoholic, but he loved, in the old days, they don't make the same formula. There must be a difference in formula. But he loved chocolate Olivers, which were oh, biscuits yeah, yeah. covered in dark chocolate. And they would only, they would sell them in Fortnum and Mason in, in London. And I would get uh, lots of it. And then, but now it's like, when I taste it, it doesn't taste anything like what, when yeah. we used to, you know, and like I said, I think the formula is different. When, when he did the uh, old grey whistle test interview in 75, he, he said, uh, you can just pay me in chocolate olivers, just send them over from England. Yes. <laughs> he loved um, So that was one of the things. And even for his birthday, I would definitely go and get chocolate cakes and things, you know. Oh. And the other thing as well, um, you were both wearing glasses, but you were hardly as blind as a bat as he was. Oh, it's terrible. Blind leading the blind, as I would say. <laughs> you know, people don't realize that when they see, you know, these photos of, of John, like that the, the horrible night of, of the troubadour and things like that, and they said, oh, he's pouncing. He couldn't see two feet in front of him. And you have a hundred photographers standing there with, with flash bulbs yeah. in your face. So all you see is this figure of of people you don't know what's going on and that it was horrible i mean so people don't realize he was blind as a bat yeah he really was and um, did you did you have, have a song as a couple like this is our song honey well here's the thing we didn't actually have a song but he would pick up songs and he would say this reminds uh me uh, of of you or whatever and one of the things that uh, that reminded him and it was later on was the little river band in reminiscing that oh, song yeah, yeah. and he loved it and he um and he said to me he says every time i hear it it just reminds me of of us you know so oh that's so sweet so i always have that that memory Pretty ragged version of Lucille uh, there by John Paul in 1974 in Los Angeles. Uh, May, you were there, of course. Um, what are your memories of Paul walking into the studio, seeing John for the first time in possibly over two years? Uh, it, was, it was quite interesting because I was facing the door and I, w I just sort of looked up as he walked through and I went, Paul? Linda? And John just turned around and went, oh. had you seen Had you seen or met Paul before? Well, here's a funny part. I actually met Paul on the streets before, you know, before um, ever meeting him, you know, uh, personally. Sure. I saw him walking down the street where I lived in uh, early, a couple of years earlier. So really had not met Paul, per se, like until now. And so, uh, and it was great because um, when I said Paul and Linda, I mean, you know, John turned his head and he went, oh, <laughs> How are you? You know that type. Of stuff. No, no big, no big fanfare, no nothing. Um, and it was great. They came in the next. They they came over to the house the next day where we were staying. You know, which is the big uh, house that that Harry Nielsen. It's actually Harry Nielsen that rented uh, for the for his album Pussycats. And so we we had you know it was it was nice and it's it was kind of funny that you know in it um, Paul was saying. What are you doing? You're 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 running around and and uh, doing things here, and don't you think you should grow up? And and because he didn't know me from a hole in the wall. Yeah. And uh, and so he says, he says no. He says me and he goes no. Yoko's fine with it. This and that. And you know I've moved on. We'll, we'll always be friends. We'll always have this. So as we're saying this, I somehow and I can't remember how I found out, but it was actually. Um, it was actually Yoko who called Paul up. That's right. She visited London, actually. And um, she well, said to Paul, no, like, she you, called, sorry. Yeah, she called him. And then she went to, to London later to get Aunt Mimi to do the same thing, was to get him to come back home. He wasn't coming back home. Hmm. That's the thing that nobody realizes. He was not going back. Yeah. And that, that was the whole thing. And because I remember John saying, oh, yeah, you know, 
Paul's trying to say I should stop all this nonsense and, and, and go back and, you know, I'm not, I told him that we were fine. And then that's when I found out later, which I don't think John ever knew, was that that Yoko actually called Paul for that. Yeah. It's mentioned in one of the books too. Yeah, well, Paul says it himself, and he did a quite a candid interview in 1986, you know, where he's describing Yoko's visit and him going out to L.A., you know, to, to pull John aside and say, this is what you got to do to get her back, blah, blah, blah. But this has been, this is manipulation, really, because he didn't know you, as you, as you say. Paul didn't know you whatsoever. And he didn't, no, and he we didn't know this. Sorry? We were fine. Yeah. It, took, it took time, but we were, we were okay later because he got a chance to see, to see Paul. And then, of course, once Paul went, uh, once John went back, Paul wasn't really allowed to come into the circle again. Yeah. But go ahead, continue about what you were saying about Paul. You said that n nobody even knew that that's what she was doing. No, because, um, you know, even in your own book, you say that Linda perhaps was a bit standoffish or just kind of sussing you out. Like, who is this yeah. woman? Yeah. Right. So nobody knew that actually it was done by Yoko. So it's this whole myth again that comes around. Yeah. I think Paul was suckered. Really do. Yeah. So so that's what happened. And even so, from a distance, like what would, what would your ob observations be of John and Yoko's relationship? Was it kind of a motherly figure more than, um, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, man, wife? Yeah, I didn't find them um, really affectionate. They were not the type, you know, like when you see a couple, you know, you you see them as, you know, you, I mean, I don't know if you can uh, get what my meaning on that is. I didn't see, I didn't get the affection that you would have when you're, when you're with, uh, when there's a couple out there, you know, you could tell that they've been together and whatever. This is more like we're going through it. I'm holding your hand. I'm, I'm yeah. taking, you, you know. Yeah. You make a good point in your book, um, Loving John, that, you know, they were more like, uh, two kids just cuddling up in bed, like under the covers, hiding from the world. Yeah. And that's, you know, that that's, you didn't feel the, the intensity of like, of, of a, um, a boyfriend, a, a man and wife in love with each other. Mm. It was more like, we're doing this. We're going to be out there in the world. We're going to, you know, we're going to do whatever as a couple, but not, not as a, a, a loving, uh, affectionate couple. It was mm. different. On your own relationship with John, I, I don't get the impression that you ever actually broke up. Is that true? No, we really didn't. I mean, outside of the circumstances, um, we saw each other. We he calls me. He would call me out of, uh, you know, and I would be like, whoa. The last time he called me was when he was in um, so Cape Town, South Africa. So it was quite interesting. And I, um, and, you know, he was... It was it was nice. We spent an hour and a half talking, and um, it was good. What did you, you know? talk about? Just trivial kind of everyday things. Trivial things. Talking about have you seen so and so? And I would say yes. And he said, how are they? And you know, I miss everyone. He, there was a loneliness in him. Yeah. That that I could read. Then he'd say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. But you could tell there was something missing. Well, I'll tell you. I don't know if you're familiar with home demos of songs like maybe half finished songs from the late 70s songs like real life or help me to help myself um you you saved my soul if you listen to those it's it's quite disturbing to digest the mood that he was in right like what what do you think what was his state of mind like in the late 70s i think when i spoke to him i just felt he was just lost because he he wasn't doing anything yeah. Not that he wasn't, you know, not that he didn't have uh, um, uh, 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 Sean to, to deal with, but it wasn't that. It was more like he was lost. Yeah. I just felt he was lost, that, that he had no purpose anymore. And it wasn't until he started thinking about recording that you had something, but it really, he, there was nothing there. I, when I talked to him, I could, I could sense it. And did, did you ever might be a difficult question, but did you ever stop loving him? Ah, how could I? It never ended. Yeah. So. 